We will now like to begin the first session for the 20th anniversary celebration for the Convention for the Safeguarding of ICH. We will have the free discussions, the panel discussion in session one. The topic of session one is living heritage and sustainable livelihoods. Session two is on living heritage and the natural world. And session three is on living heritage and quality education. And tomorrow we'll have session four on living heritage in a digital environment. And, such, and then we will adopt the Seoul vision. Now we will have the panel discussion on the topic of living heritage and sustainable livelihoods. And the session will be moderated by Ambassador Park Sang-mi. And for the panel members, we have Ms. Harriet Deakin, Honorary Research Fellow at the University of Cape Town, Ms. Ananya Bhattacharya, Director of Bangladesh.com, and His Ex Her Excellency Ms. Marcella Miriam Losardo, Ambassador of the Permanent Delegation of the Argentine to UNESCO, and Mr. Ahmed Skunti, Professor at the National Her Institute of Archaeological and Heritage Sciences, and Ms. Ati Izquierdo from Bogota. Ladies and gentlemen, dear panelists, dear colleagues, good morning and welcome. First, let me introduce myself. My name is Sangmi Bak. I'm the ambassador and permanent delegate of the Republic of Korea to UNESCO. I'm very happy to welcome you to this thematic session on living heritage and sustainable livelihoods at the Seoul Global Meeting 20th anniversary celebration of the Convention for the Safeguarding of the Intangible Cultural Heritage. Welcome also to all participants who are following online. Please allow me to share a few reflections on the topic to frame the very interesting conversation we are about to start. Living heritage can no longer be a, is no doubt pillar for sustainable livelihood of communities. Many local practices with the skills and knowledge that they entail are linked to subsistence and economic dimensions. They generate revenue and are thus part of local economies. We have numerous examples throughout the world, including several activities related to handicrafts, food ways, and performances that can attract local and international audiences. These practices that are transmitted through generations and adapt to changing context can be a pillar for locally owned sustainable livelihood, but this is not automatic. The intersection between living heritage and economic development is complex and multifaceted. Economic activity can have both positive and negative effects on living heritage safeguarding, as well as the livelihoods of practitioners and communities. We know that some elements of living heritage, such as sacred or secret practices, are not suited for inclusion in commercial activity from the community perspective. Even for those that have been or can be appropriately included in economic activity, there may be growing threats to living heritage related to changing economic conditions, such as rapid economic transformation. These threats might include decontextualization, over-commercialization, misrepresentation or misappropriation, which may weaken practice and transmission of living heritage and the very meaning of these practices for their communities, thus threatening their viability and the potential leverage of living heritage for livelihoods. On the other side of the spectrum, Many expressions of living heritage are threatened precisely because they have become economically unviable for their practitioners, thus discouraging younger generation to continue practicing and leading to loss of repertoire. But 
there are also huge opportunities for us to put living heritage at the heart of sustainable economies and curb these threats, contributing to the attainment of several sustainable development goals, such as SDG 2, Zero Hunger, SDG 8, on decent work and economic growth, and SDG 11 on sustainable cities and communities. There are many relevant experiences that show that the integration of intangible heritage safeguarding in local development policies and projects with the active and significant participation of the communities can harness the power of living heritage to improve income and beyond income contribute to better lively, livelihoods. The purpose of this panel is to discuss how to leverage living heritage for sustainable livelihood in the decades to come, exploring the ways to maximize the positive effects on communities, groups, and individuals while mitigating negative impacts of economic activities on living heritage safeguarding and sustainable development. For this, we have a special group of panelists who will allow us to address the issue from a variety of angles, including conceptual approaches, institutional approaches, but also local and project-based experience in different regions, including Asia, Latin America, and the Arab states. Today's roundtable will include a question to our five panelists joining us today, as well as some time for the, the, for the questions from the audience. I'll be introducing our esteemed five panelists as we go along, but before we begin, I believe we have a short video from a youth participant to help kick off our discussion. By the way, this video was specially made for this meeting. Greetings, everyone. My name is Juan Sebastián Mosquera. I'm an anthropologist, and I've been working for the last five years with the community of Pile in Ecuador for the safeguarding of the traditional weaving of the Ecuadorian toquilla straw hat, which was registered in UNESCO's representative list in 2012. Weaving means more than producing refined handicrafts. It's a way of life that reflects the social values of the artisan communities as they are passed on through family ties and community networks. That said, Safeguarding the intangible cultural heritage is important because it allows us to build our own identity, which is a sign of freedom. Although the artists and communities are proud and aware of the social and cultural importance of weaving, producing the hats is not profitable as it requires long days of work that can make up to nine months to weave one hat only. Time and the fineness of the straw are mainly what define the price of the hats, but the efforts put into them don't pay off to the toquilla producers and weavers because customers look for bargains. However, many big fashion brands around the world and local middlemen sell the hats for high prices, while the community struggle to afford the straw and the costs of maintenance for the toquilla fields. Economic pressure, environmental degradation, demographic issues, and cultural globalization are some of the threats that this traditional knowledge faces. But while such insecurities increase, the artisans keep on weaving as the tradition dictates. As the 2003 convention reaches its 20th anniversary, and ten and a half years ago, this element was inscribed in the representative list, several actions have been carried out to guarantee the continuity of the weaving, but it is necessary to dive more deeply into the economic and environmental dimensions of the intangible cultural heritage and how we are engaging youth, considering their interests and their expectations. It's on the barriers to instill an understanding of their intangible cultural heritage in the younger generations, and on the international community to create a positive impact in the public and private sectors, so that traditions are valued and fairness becomes a human quality. How can you help us ensuring the economic stability of practitioners and their communities while preserving their cultural traditions? Well, it was a very interesting testimonial of Juan Sebastián Mosquera a young anthropologist working with the community of Pile in Ecuador in the safeguarding of traditional weaving 
of their Tokia hat. Um, now it's time for me to introduce our first panelist. Um, is Dr. Harriet Deacon. Dr. Deacon, you are an internationally renowned expert on intangible cultural heritage. You have ample experience as a researcher, facilitator, and drafter of tr uh, training materials and reports working closely alongside UNESCO. You were involved in several research projects exploring the role of intangible heritage in sustainable development in India and Kyrgyzstan and Northern Europe. You have consulted with WIPO's traditional knowledge division on the training, mentoring, and matchmaking program on intellectual property for women entrepreneurs from local communities since 2022. Dr. Deacon, as I mentioned earlier, the relation between living heritage and livelihood is complex with both positive and negative implications. Could you elaborate on this and also explain what you see as possible ways forward? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to be here today. It's a great privilege to be part of this discussion on the important uh, occasion of the anniversary of the convention. Um, today, I'm going to be drawing on some insights from a report uh, I worked on for the Secretariat uh, based on a request from the committee in 2019 that the Secretariat prepare a guidance note for communities and states parties concerning the safeguarding measures and good practices that address the risks of decontextualization and over-commercialization of elements of living heritage. And uh, essentially that uh, report, which was developed with the assistance of a group, an advisory group of uh, people from 26 uh, different uh, experts, um, was really trying to answer the question that that video pr proposed, that how do communities deal with the challenges of the market? And for a long time, the heritage sector has been a bit reluctant to talk about money because heritage is priceless and we don't want to sell our heritage and we want to retain our, the social value um, and the cultural value and not just talk about money. But at the same time, not talking about money means that we don't um, support communities in engaging with the market, which they often do, because heritage, as Sangmi said, is also about livelihoods. So what we did in this report is we looked um, not just at the decisions of the committee and the, the discussions in the convention itself, but we also did a desk review of academic work, we did a survey of, um, we had a thousand responses from different stakeholders, NGOs and, and communities and other stakeholders. We looked at case studies and we also developed some recommendations going forward. So today I'm going to give four conclusions of the study and three of the recommendations. Uh, first of all, um, the relationship between living heritage safeguarding and the market is complex, as Sangmi mentioned. And I think it's this diversity that's really important to appreciate. Um, the fact that different kinds of living heritage and different communities makes, may seek different relationships with the market is a really important starting point, as well as the fact it is that communities themselves need to drive that decision-making process. Secondly, the question of positive and negative effects of the market actually underplays the importance of looking at the dynamics of that relationship. And partly because we've been so embarrassed for so long talking about money, we haven't really discussed enough what are the models of the dynamics of this relationship. How do the sort of more heritage practices um, relate to what might be a more commercial cultural industries part of the market? We don't talk enough 
across the different conventions in UNESCO, for example. And secondly, when we talk about the market, there are risks of third-party control over marketing of, of heritage and inequalities in the way in which communities benefit from the market vis-a-vis -vis third parties. But there are also differences within communities and differences between different entrepreneurs in the community um, framework. Thirdly, while the convention, the work under the convention and academic work has spoken about many mitigations against the risks and threats in the market, we don't really have good guidance on how to choose mitigations for a particular circumstance, which legal measures or which ethical guidelines are relevant in which circumstances. And how do we tie that into a general safeguarding program for um, protecting communities in a market um, environment and giving them more control. And then finally, uh, there are a number of great examples of uh, supporting uh, communities and communities creating their own support programs to uh, benefit from the market and manage risks. Um, how, do the, how does this support map itself out? How do we choose what kinds of support will best work in specific environments? So, when we're looking at the way forward, I want to mention three suggestions from the research. First, we need a better understanding of the relationship between cultural and economic sustainability. We looked at a lot of research and case studies, mainly focusing on material that's available in English, but this needs to be further expanded. Secondly, we need better systemic models, kind of ecosystem models, if you like, of the relationship between transmission and practice of heritage and then its innovation and adaptation in the market context. Um, models based on donut economics talk not only about the dangers of over-commercialization or too much economic uh, engagement, but also the dangers of under-remuneration or too little attention to livelihoods. And we need to adapt some of these models to look at um, economic uh, activity in relation to heritage. We need to develop safeguarding planning, monitoring and evaluation methodologies that can help communities to make decisions about how best to control the engagement in the market and protect themselves and maintain uh, safeguarding um, approaches. These should rec recognize the centrality of community agency in decisions about economic use of their living heritage. We need to understand more about what we mean by context. We worry about decontextualization, but we don't discuss enough what does context mean in terms of intangible heritage safeguarding. And we need to talk about differences in interests between individual community entrepreneurs and the community as a whole in deciding safeguarding strategies. Particular attention should be paid to the risks and opportunities in the digital sphere. There's going to be a panel on this uh, tomorrow. But this is really important to look at how the opportunities and risks change over time, especially with artificial intelligence and machine learning. The second recommendation from the um, guidance note is that we need more specific ethical guidance on managing economic aspects of safeguarding for states, parties, and other stakeholders, as well as for the committee. And these guidance should be based on the findings of the, um, uh, and the needs of the different stakeholders and discussions in, the, uh, intergovernment, in an intergovernmental working group. We may need also to amend the operational directives, which have been developed quite piecemeal, actually, in relation to eco economic aspects. 
And then the third recommendation is to provide support to communities so that they can uh, better plan to manage the risks and threats and benefit sustainably and equitably from use of their living heritage in the market. There have been some interesting approaches in this regard. There was a, a, a study in Australia that looked at systems mapping approaches to developing um, economic initiatives around bush foods for indigenous Australians that looked at different challenges that they, farmers and um, food producers faced in the market and how different kinds of legal and other strategies could be used to assist them. In Colombia, Artisanias de Colombia is a body that's uh, funded partly by government that helps communities to engage in the market um, in a way that benefits them and takes up legal cases as necessary, provides them with marketing platforms and assists them to, um, to engage in the market and con control that engagement. Um, the Heritage Sensitive um, Intellectual Property and Marketing Strategies Project that I worked on with, with Ananya uh, does uh, looks at a sort of dedicated community strategies to address specific challenges in the market. And finally, indigenous communities such as the Sami in uh, the northern part of Europe have, are working to develop uh, community-based strategies to manage economic engagement and to try and lobby for the kinds of support that they need from government where necessary. Uh, thank you very much, Sangi. I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Harriet. Uh, as one of the key figures in, since the forming stage of the convention, uh, Dr. Deacon has raised several key issues and also proposed several recommendations, uh, especially focusing upon uh, the role of ICH in the context of uh, livelihood. Uh, our next panelist is Ms. Ananya Bhattacharya. Uh, Ms. Bhattacharya, you are co-founder and director of Contact Base, a social enterprise headquartered in Kolkata and working across India for fostering inclusive and sustainable development using culture-based approaches. You have led research communication for development and community-based creative in enterprise development initiatives of the organization. Your organization has been partnering with national and state governments to promote grassroots creative economy and cultural tourism. A key aim is to uphold artists' rights and build their capacity for management of their heritage. You are involved in global advocacy for greater recognition of the contribution of culture in achieving sustainable development goals. Ms. Bhattacharya, drawing from your experience at Contact Base, could you please give us an example where living heritage safeguarding has contributed to improving local livelihoods in a sustainable manner? What were the key conditions for this positive interaction to happen? Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for inviting me to share our experiences. I had some photos to show, so if they can be on screen. Um, um, my name is Ananya, and I'm from India. And we have been working for now more than 15 years on professionalizing traditional skills as livelihood. And I'd like to share some of our key learnings. If we think of answering your question, if we think of what are the key factors which work, you know, the main thing is building the skill transmission ecosystem. And as Harriet pointed out, the need of the artist to have direct access to market and enjoy control on the market. And the whole thing, overall, the whole thing needs to be seen using a lens of rights. I think that is the basic philosophy. I'll take specifically the example of a part of West Bengal, which is called Purulia. The government of West Bengal 
has had a partnership with UNESCO New Delhi for a project for developing rural craft and cultural hubs. And this is also the 10th year of that intervention. So Purulia, the main art form of that district is called Chow Dance, which is also inscribed in the UNESCO representative list of heritage of humanity. It's a vigorous acrobatic martial dance where the dancers wear big, very ornate masks. I think I wanted to show you the photos, but I think it's not ready. So uh, in this village, around 150 years back, the local king, he had patronized the dance and he had settled the mask makers there. So the masks are made with clay and paper pulp. It's a village is known as Charida. Now what happened is through this systemic interventions, for developing the skill transmission ecosystem and market linkage, we found that today Charida has emerged as a cultural tourism destination. And every day there are visitors to that village and their annual sale is to the, sorry, their daily sale is to the tune of 2000 to $2,500 per day. And Last December, which is like the peak tourism season, there were more than 500,000 visitors to this region. But if we flip the clock and go back 10 years, this was the poorest part of the country. No, no one went there because it was known for insurgency. It is a very arid area with only one cropping season. People were extremely poor. 60% of people were extremely poor. Now, with this voluntary national reporting going on, only last week, uh, the Niti Ayog, which is a planning mechanism of our country, they published the report on multidimensional poverty index, which considers not only the income, but also other aspects like education, quality of life, um, child marriage prevention, and things like that. And the state of West Bengal, in the last five years, so 2015 was a baseline, and 2021 was when this study was carried out. So there has been a 10 percent uh, point reduction in poverty. And for Purulia, which had more than 50 percent poor people in 2015, now it has 25 percent poor people. So that has been the in improvement. Now where we need to really look at when we are looking at this 20 years of anniversary celebration is evidence building. So this study clearly shows that poverty has reduced. Now, what is the link of this poverty reduction with the cultural tourism interventions, the cultural de industry development interventions? That research has not happened. But I think we really need to look into all these signals of how powerful culture is for sustainable development. So what has worked there is the senior or the masters of the living heritage, they have established an ecosystem of skill transmission and even the formal education mechanism has come forward to partner. So the local university, they give a certificate to people who after completing school education, they do that one year diploma course and they get a certificate and they take immense pride, the young people that they have a certificate from the university on Chow Dance. So these are some of very important steps. Another important thing which happened in 2018, the patent office of the science department, they worked with the community and now the community, the Chow mask making has geographical indication registration. Now these tools are extremely important. It not only creates recognition, it creates recognition at local, national, and international level. So when we were working in the HIPAMS project, which Harriet just mentioned, we worked with the communities to explain to them how they could use GI, how they could use the fact that Cho is inscribed in the UNESCO representative list, you know, for their own promotion to add it to the stories. And stories are extremely powerful. And there comes in the role of digital technology. Because what is important for sustainable livelihood based on culture is the community needs to have voice, the community has to be the protagonist. So these artists, they have learned the use of digital storytelling and that project intervention saved them during COVID. 
So in COVID, when most of the artists were not digitally trained across India, these communities who had got that opportunity, they started showcasing online, they started conducting heritage education programs, they easily shifted to digital markets because India-wide there was an intervention where all online retailers came forward to take directly um, products from the community. So that was again a very beautiful intervention showcasing how multiple stakeholders can come together. Another important thing which has happened as a result of these interventions for grassroots cultural industry development is about, you know, women empowerment. Many of the ICH traditions, not only Cho, had been very male-centric. It had men used to dance, men used to make the crafts, but with all the development, women have come forward. And today there are 15 women groups which dance Cho, which, was ne which never happened 20 years back. So today there are like 5,000 Cho artists in that village of Charida, who, uh, in that area of Purulia, and around 80 families of mass makers in Charida who are benefiting. And one main strategy which really worked, which we call art for life, that is connecting art, artist, and village, is that the village was promoted as an entity, the entire community. And a community museum was set up there, annual village festivals were planted to celebrate ICH, and all that led to greater recognition of that area. So these are extremely important steps. Harriet was mentioning about the ecosystem, and you also mentioned that all ICH is not for commercialization. But what happens when that ecosystem is, gets created, it helps the others too. So there is another Santal village, Majramura, which is a tradition of scroll painting. And they are still very poor because that tradition, we started working it, with it only six, seven years back. But what happened? Because of the exposure, because of the increased tourism in the district, because of people going in, from only four or five people practicing the art in 2016, today there are at least 20 people doing it. And they have come out recently with a wonderful painting on how climate change is affecting. So you see, they are able to tell contemporary stories. And this is the third thing which is extremely important, opening up convents of exchange and uh, collaboration, not only from the region, but from across the world, because this creates a lot of power. So some of the good things which have been happening in the last two years, a government in another state of uh, India, Rajasthan, they are also partnering with UNESCO to develop cultural tourism based on local ICH. So there are the villages in deserts where Communities are musicians by profession. And usually they will sing in restaurant in the traditional framework or they will go to uh, festivals. But last year, one of the young artists, they got Aga Khan Award for music. So, you know, the whole recognition now has shifted to a global arena. So what I want to say is that in the what we really now need to work is on policy integration and Ban Ki-moon mentioned about the transversal role. As a result of 2003, the governments, the national governments, the state parties have integrated safeguarding, but I think how we can integrate so that there's better access to finance, better access to infrastructure, these are the real points. Thank you. Thank you, Ananya. Uh, I think uh, what Ananya just said is particularly important because it reflects the voices of the communities and Experts might have an idea of the best way of safeguarding, but it may differ from the views of the communities. Uh, and I think it will be even more important in the next 20 years in, for us to planning the, for the future of ICH safeguarding. According to your program, the next panelist uh, is uh, Professor Ahmed Skunti of Morocco, but he is on his way from Incheon Airport to this place at the moment. Uh, he had some complications with his visas and flight schedule. So we will move to our next panelist, hoping that uh, Professor Skunti can join us. So I'll move his name 
to the la as the last uh, panelist. Uh, so our next uh, panelist is Ms. Ati Kigua, who is joining us online from Colombia. Uh, Ms. Kigua, uh, you are an activist, the Colombian government's indigenous commissioner for peace, and was elected the first indigenous counselor to the Bogota Council and the first indigenous woman vice president of the council, where you are currently serving your third term. Two of your key achievements include the creation of the public policy Edo Police, which provides environmental protection for rivers and other natural waterways, and the development of the Buen Vivir model that promotes practices in harmony of the co coexistence between humans and nature and to create spaces for intellectual intercultural exchange. Now, could you kindly explain to us how living heritage can contribute to sustainable livelihoods from the perspective of indigenous peoples? Thank you. We don't have sound at the moment. If the sound problem is resolved, could you let me know? Uh, well, Ms. So a greeting from, uh, from the heart of the world, uh, from the Sierra Santa Marta of Colombia. Thank you, Thank you very much for your invitation to uh, re remember to together, celebrate together the 20th uh, uh, celebration of the safeguarding of the uh, intangible cultural heritage. Uh, greetings to my companions uh, of Pani and I would like to invite all of you in thinking of the earth as, uh, as uh, the source of uh, right and knowledge in, in, the, uh, in the First Nations uh, of the Sierra, and Quan Quambo and others, uh, they have recently declared, uh, as has been declared intangible cultural heritage of, uh, of UNESCO in order to transform our uh, social judicial structures and anthropocentric and social judicial that allows us uh, to conciliate our culture, our territories, our cities with the cycles of uh, uh, vital cycles of nature, with the natural cycle of water and uh, food, and also from the feminine wisdom of our uh, communities. And the earth has always been a living classroom, uh, a space of learning. And for me, this is fundamental. The system of knowledge of First Nations uh, for, the, for the indigenous uh, communities for the earth. I think that after the pandemic, we have to, as humanity, to have a profound reflection on the interdependency that we have and our responsibility that is shared in order to share our uh, housing. Uh, this is one of the great challenges that we have. So first of all, to recognize these systems of knowledge of the indigenous uh, communities in the world uh, in order uh, for, for the uh, uh, safeguarding of the biodiversity, the cultural biodiversity knowledge systems, they are very uh, closely uh, joined together with biodiversity. And for me, it's uh, 
uh, important for uh, to share my knowledge of how our uh, systems of knowledge and our cosmology can translate itself in the public uh, uh, scene for uh, so that our cities uh, might uh, reconcile itself uh, with the natural uh, cycle of water. That is uh, the case uh, for Bogata. Uh, Bogata, the uh, of uh, my uh, uh, city, and so to be a uh, a city of water. So with the uh, with the fundamental of Ayala uh, of uh, Latin America and this uh, nest this, this requirement and necessity to invite humanity to have this vision uh, and to think about alternatives, alternates uh, to uh, which uh, uh, change uh, the uh, ways of life of our communities in order to have a better uh, sustainable and healthy uh, uh, future and in peace for all. I think that with education, the biggest challenge is uh, of, of course, uh, an intercultural education. The interculturality uh, uh, as a, uh, acknowledgement with the nature, we think that peace has to be also with uh, the with nature. And in Colombia, we are advancing in understanding that our ecosystems have been victims of the conflict of wars and has to be considered, uh, uh, has uh, to be uh, uh, subject to the reparations uh, that we owe to nature. And for me, it's important that with love, I can serve uh, our city, our country and humanity, and also our territories. And I prepared a video to know who, uh, for those who don't know this uh, wonderful uh, wealth uh, that our country can have. Uh, so just to give you an idea. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Tikwa, for joining us from Colombia and sharing experience uh, uh, of the perspective of indigenous population on our theme, uh, ICH and subsistence livelihoods. Uh, our next panelist is Her Excellency Marcela Miriam Lozardo, uh, Ambassador, Permanent Delegate of Argentina to UNESCO. Your Excellency, you play an active role in advancing UNESCO's objective of peace through international cooperation in education, science, and culture. You have held several leading positions in UNESCO's governing bodies, including the Executive Board and the World Heritage Committee. You count extensive professional experience and commitment to justice, human rights, and gender equality. Your background includes positions such as the ministry, Minister of Justice and Human Rights of Argentina and roles in public administration and legal advisory positions. You have actively worked on public policy design, implementation, and protection of human rights, including gender equality, social inclusion, and combating domestic violence and human trafficking. Your Excellency, Latin America is a region with a rich diversity of living heritage where many practices involve an economic dimension. We have festivals, carnivals, numerous practices related to crafts. How do you see the contribution of uh, living heritage to sustainable livelihoods and economic development in Latin America? Thank you so much, my friend, Ambassador. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure for me to be here. Um, for UNESCO, for Argentina, for the world, which is the link between intangible cultural heritage or living heritage and sustainable livelihoods. We highlight the importance that this link has for our future at a time when technology advances seems to dominate our daily concerns. Humanity appears separate from nature when it should be thought as an integral part of it, keeping in this mind in the political decisions that are made every day for hours. 
Living heritage includes a wide range of cultural expressions and traditions passed down from generation to generation. From dances and ancestral rituals to crafts, music, and gastronomy, living heritage is the reflection of our identity, connecting us to our roots. These expressions not only help us to understand and appreciate our history, but also enrich our lives, lives with a sense of belonging and unity with our communities. Living heritage is an evidence of the cultural diversity of our humanity. Its community has its own way of expressing itself and keeping its traditions alive. By preserving and promoting these cultural expressions, we are fostering tolerance, respect, and appreciation of the different among us. Living heritage not only can be a source of employment, tourism, and local economic development, but also plays a crucial role in the sustainable development of communities. Sustainable livelihoods are those that enable communities to meet their current needs without compromising the ability of future generations to do the same. It is not only about guaranteeing the conservation of the environment, but also about promoting social and economic balance. The importance of preserving living heritage and promoting sustainable livelihoods is more evident than ever in the globalized world that we are facing. Local cultures and traditions face significant challenges. Cultural uniformity and weak developments can th be threatened survival on our most valuable heritage. However, if we really work together and make responsible decisions, we can find solutions to balance progress with preserving our cultural heritage in this sense. It is crucial to promote the importance of living heritage in our education systems, in schools, communities. Knowing and appreciating our traditions will help to protect them. For this reason, we must avoid actions that make economic activity less and less sustainable. We should act responsibility and respecting the local traditions of the valued communities, urban, rural, or coastals, in economic activities such as tourism, agriculture, fishing, in order to preserve the sustainability as sources of income. Responsibility in our daily lives, such as adopting sustainable practices, reducing our waste of resource, and promoting environment education is nowadays crucial. Argentina adopted in 2021 a law of environment education in all our schools. We must encourage leaders and governments to take such concrete measures to safeguard our heritage and promote the conservation of nature's and sustainable development. It is our responsibility to make sure that the future generations, our kids, our boys, can also enjoy cultural diversity and the beauty of nature. We must remember that we are temporary guardians of the planet, and therefore we have the obligation to act with respect towards our environment. The 2003 UNESCO conventions were celebrated today has a very important role to play in this regard. Argentina has currently three cultural expressions included to the intangible cultural heritage list. Tango, shared with Uruguay, the Buenos Aires, Filet, Pictorial Technique, and the Chamame tradition, traditional dance and music. The Tango and the Filet constitute two typical manifestations of the citizens of Buenos Aires, reaffirming the geography of the Rio de la Plata. The Chamamé represents a different way that identifies the people of the northeastern part of the country with their traditional and their land. In all these three cases, these cultural manifestations allow those who practice them professionally, a livelihood associated with tradition. In the case of tango, the music has been promoted through music streaming platforms, which are popular channels for consumption in the digital age. Many tango-related artists and record labels have taken advantage of these platforms to spread their music and expand their reach re globally. Digitalization 
offers great opportunities to spread knowledge about tango through online courses, webinars, and interactive educational sources. These initiatives are aimed at both professional dancers and musicians, as well as enthusiastic and amateurs, promoting understanding and appreciating for tango as a cultural expression. Social networks and other online platforms also contribute to promoting and disseminating Buenos Aires Filet Worldwide. Artists and organizations from all over the world cooperate to spread that pictorial technique and create cultural exchange online. Also, the teaching of chamamé is encouraged in schools, cultural institutions, and communities. Training programs have been established for museums, dancers, and teachers interested in this traditional music. Today, we are celebrating 20 days of this intangible work heritage. However, the simple recognition of the tangible world heritage is not truly enough to preserve and protect it, since this must be followed by active policies by the different countries. In this sense, I would like now to refer briefly and more especially to the policies and actions that have been carried out in Argentina. The Argentine Minister of Culture has carried out this, a series of actions of safe words in tangible culture heritage, including the organization of training activities, the promotion of the visibility of intangible uh, cultural expressions, and the participation of associated communities in the management and safeguarding of intangible cultural heritage. That minister promotes, as well, the identification of the expression of living heritage raises awareness among the population in general, and trains cultural managers and representatives of public and private institutions. Argentina promotes the identification of living heritage in many ways, including through a database that gathers the information collected by communities, groups, institutions, and people interested in taking care of the elements identified by them. This database is updated regularly. In 2019, the Argentine Committee for Intangible Culture was created in order to strengthen the country's submissions to the UNESCO list to articulate the different national organizations for a comprehensive approach to the subject. Argentina has had an active presence in CRESPIAL, UNESCO Category 2 Center, and has accompanied regional safeguarded initiative by undertaking actions related to elements of the intangible cultural of Afro-descendant and other communities. An additional point to note in relation to the safeguarding of the intangible work heritage is the international collaboration required between different countries and communities. It is really very important to promote the exchange of knowledge, experience, and resources between different organizations, artists, and experts from different regions of all the world. In this sense, Argentina promotes the safeguarding of living heritage also to the regional level through the inscription of shared elements in the Mercosur cultural heritage list. In this regard, in 2023, the country hosted an important meeting in the framework of MERCOSUR in which the communities, public organizations, researchers, and interest parties exchange experience and reflections. Finally, I want to emphasize that living heritage constitutes an invaluable treasure that we must protect and preserve. Not only does it enrich our lives, but it can also help to connect an economical, sustainable way with our history, our identity, and our communities. As individuals and as a community, we have a responsibility to act in solidarity to protect who we are and who will be. Together, we can strike a balance between traditions and progress, building a future in which our living heritage remains the expression of our humanity. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, dear Ambassador. Um, now we come to the last panelist of this session, uh, Professor Ahmed Skunti. And as I said earlier, uh, we will be connected to his mobile phone and ex uh, hoping for the best and keeping our fingers crossed, we hope that the 
connection works. Okay, uh, we'll try. Uh, professor Skunti uh, is a professor of anthropology and heritage at the National Institute of Archaeology and Heritage Sciences, Morocco. And he has worked with the UNESCO World Heritage Convention since 1998 and have contributed to drafting this convention, the 2003 UNESCO ICH Convention. And he also has chaired uh, the evaluation body of ICH Convention in 2015 and 2017. Um, and uh, Professor Skunti is an experienced researcher, teacher, and facilitator of the 2003 convention and have supported numerous uh, capacity building. He's here? Wow, so <laughs> big applause. <laughs> Professor Skunti, who has made every effort to be here. So actually, this is much better than uh, I expected. And I'm very happy to have <laughs> Professor Skunti. Um, I think this is a testament to Korea's uh, transportation system. <laughs> um, can you talk now, Professor Skunti? <laughs> um, the question we have for Professor Skunti to uh, give us and enlighten us is, could you please explain what is required to integrate living heritage safeguarding in national and local policies and programs for uh, sustainable livelihood? Could you provide some examples with that, please? I think it's okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank me. Uh, hello, uh, everyone. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for having waited for me to, to arrive. I would like to thank uh, the... <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to thank the government uh, of the Republic of Korea and UNESCO for the invitation to attend this important meeting uh, as we are celebrating the 20th anniversary of the uh, Intangible Cultural Heritage Convention. Um, it would be difficult to answer uh, this question in the, in the time frame, uh, but I think there are two questions we should ask ourselves. First, uh, where do we come from? And the second, where, are, where do we want to go? Uh, when we look uh, behind, I think from its inception, the convention linked intangible culture heritage with sustainable development. As you know, it is in Article 2. And uh, during the first years of the implementation, uh, this link was not as evident as it should have been. And as uh, Harriet uh, uh, recalled us, the issue of commercialization and over-commercialization was discussed. And this uh, was considered as a, a threat to the intangible cultural heritage. But around 2010, I think something had changed, and I remember the discussions we had mainly in Bali in 2011, where the issue of development and sustainable development in its relation with intangible cultural heritage was debated. And something changed at that moment. And I think this uh, led the organs of the convention to reflect on the relationship between intangible culture heritage and sustainable development, which led, as you know, to the adoption of the chapter six in the operational directives. I think now we need to go beyond and uh, explore ways to 
uh, link effectively uh, intangible culture heritage to uh, sustainable development in concrete ways for the benefit of communities, groups, and individuals, and wider societies. Uh, there are two uh, observations that I would make at this stage. The first one is that all ICH domains do not stand at the same distance to uh, sustainable development. For example, if we look at the five domains, uh, the, the second one on performing arts and the fifth one on crafts and know-how uh, have evident link with uh, sustainable development and with commerce, with economy, and we witness this in our societies. The other three domains, this, is not, this link is not very evident. And I think particularly to the fourth domain on the knowledge and the practices related to the nature and the universe, which is for me the weakest uh, domain uh, and the most threatened. The second point is uh, the degree of inclusion or integration of ICH expressions, knowledge and practices in public policies. This varies from one domain to the other. And even inside each domain, this varies from, from one element to the other. For example, if you take midwife. In Morocco, the midwife is part of the health system. This is something coming from the tradition, but it is integrated in, a, in, the, health, in the modern health system. And the opposite, if you look at the well digger, uh, it is threatened because the techniques we, we have in hand now to, uh, to search for underground water do no longer, uh, uh, is no longer based on the knowledge of the well digger. Then the, the elements are in different positions, in dif standing different distances from uh, sustainable development. Uh, now I come to my proposal. I think that in a, on a case-by-case -case basis, we, we need to reflect and design formal nomenclatures for ICH work and let's uh, say the word, ICH jobs, with the objective of unleashing the potential of intangible cultural heritage in terms of economic, social, and environmental sustainable development. In doing so, we can uh, make the intangible cultural heritage, we can uh, have a sort of typology of works and jobs that are linked to uh, the intangible culture heritage and explore ways of integrating these uh, works in modern policies for, to, for the benefit of uh, communities, groups, and the individuals so that the bearers and the practitioners can benefit from uh, health insurance, social protection, uh, retirement rights. Uh, I, I think that this way we can make the link uh, work. And to finish, I have one uh, uh, story to, to, to tell. Uh, with a colleague, we were doing uh, field work in the end of 2020 and the beginning of 2021 to study the impact of the COVID-19 in the Jamal Fna Square, which as you know, was proclaimed as a masterpiece of the oral and the intangible culture heritage of humanity before being integrated to the representative list in 2008. Uh, in uh, Moroccan Arabic language, uh, Maddi is 
in the same time material and financial. And la maddi is uh, intangible and without money, money empty. One of our interviewees, who is a, a comic theater artist, told us when we were doing the interview, he said, we understood from the beginning, from the proclamation, that this heritage is la maddi, which means without money. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Skunti, especially for making extra efforts to be here. And um, now we've heard from all five panelists. And um, I'm sorry to announce that due to some technical difficulties, uh, questions from the audience can only be made in English. Uh, sorry about that. And uh, because of time constraint, uh, we will take maybe a couple of questions from the audience, and I will give each panelist just one minute to wrap up. If your question is directed to any particular panelist, please say so. And when you ask your question for our record recording purposes, uh, please identify yourself and your institution. So uh, please indicate your intention to ask a question by raising your hand. Okay. Yes, please. Uh, maybe a microphone is needed. Hello, my name is Dylan Go from Australia, and I'm an independent scholar. I have a question for Professor Ahmed Skunti. Thank you for your talk just then. For me personally, I'm interested in the intersections of street dance and intangible cultural heritage and in terms of ways that street dance can be safeguarded through sustainable development. I was particularly uh, interested in your term ICH jobs, which you mentioned in your talk. So my question is, for ICH jobs, what would be, if there was a job description for an ICH job, what would be some of the prerequisites for that? For example, would you require someone to study intangible cultural heritage at a university or at a tertiary level for them to be uh, able to apply for an ICH job. Thank you. Thank you. We'll wait for maybe another question, if there's any, uh, for us to answer. Yes, please. Professor Blake. Yes, hello, thank you very much for a really stimulating set of uh, interventions. This is maybe a challenge as much as a question. Sorry, Janet Blake uh, from Shahid Behesh University in Tehran, um, which is to do, you mentioned, I think it was both Harriet and Ananya, you referred to the importance of the community voice and we heard also the video, the uh, lady from in indigenous community in Colombia. Here my question is, how do we get that voice into the process of developing the legislative texts that Harriet referred to? I mean, it's a huge challenge, I understand, but I think international law at the moment is at a cusp, is that a, a place where it has to reevaluate how it is formulated, including who is formulating it? I mean, I know this is a very major issue, but your thoughts on that would be interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Blake. Um, now, um, it sounds ridiculously short. Ah, there is another question. I uh, will just take one more question and we'll walk hear from the panelists. Um, hello, uh, thank you very much for your um, comments and ideas. Uh, uh, my name is uh, Seo Chun-soo from uh, International Center for Documentary Heritage. 
Uh, I have a question, uh, this question to Ms. Harriet Deacon. Um, uh, stakeholders in uh, cultural heritage are trying their best for safeguarding, but the problem with this uh, safeguarding heritage sometimes comes from the finding and securing human and financial resources. Um, as you mentioned, we don't like money to manipulate, but uh, we want that for our benefit. And institutions and communities are, in many cases, uh, responsible for obtaining and increasing such uh, capacities at the same time. Um, so there, uh, this is one of the major challenges. Uh, as you mentioned, that there is not enough guidelines or ideas that can provide the capabilities, uh, and we are reluctant to talk about money. But uh, in the field of documentary heritage, uh, we will discuss this in terms of a fundraising strategies at the interregional level. Um, do you have any uh, suggestions or ideas on how to increase um, such as strategic partnerships with fr private sectors? from maybe from your experience uh, uh, in ICH, like how to develop an initiative of fundraising or other ways to gain support from the market or a private sector for cultural heritage. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, now, uh, Dr. Deacon has two questions to answer and Professor Skunti has one question. I'm sorry to ask you, but uh, incorporating your answers into this general remark, uh, each panelist will have one minute, and we'll go in the same order of uh, presentation. So we will start with Dr. Deacon. Thank, thank you very much, and thank you for the questions. I think uh, just two comments, one on each of the issues. Um, in terms of getting the community voice into legislative environments, specifically around livelihoods, I think Australia's had an interesting model where community members have got together to develop a protocol. And then there's also a community panel that looks at specific, uh, that's proposed to look at specific uh, initiatives and where the how that can benefit uh, communities, indigenous communities in Australia. So Terry Janke has been working on that, and I think that's actually quite an interesting model to, to explore. Um, in terms of the private sector, you know, there's been this process of periodic reporting under the convention, and I've been involved in some of the analysis of, of the Latin America and European uh, reports so far in the first two cycles. And what I've seen there is that countries are not reporting huge amounts of private sector partnership in terms of safeguarding. But there have been a few initiatives, if you look at the convention's website and the um, analysis of the periodic reports, there are a few initiatives there. And I think that actually, um, in a way, when we talk about investment in the intangible heritage sector, um, there's a lot of government and private sector investment in different sectors, in technology and healthcare. And I think that we need to start putting um, social and cultural issues into that space to look at investment, where investment is not just seen as a subsidy but seen as an investment for something, for benefit. And I think that when you start talking about the benefits of that investment, you're not just you know, putting your hand out for a subsidy, uh, you're actually talking about its impact on society. And I think this links to what um, Ahmed was talking about in terms of um, ICH creating jobs and generating livelihoods uh, or contributing to livelihoods. So I suppose we just need to change the tone of that conversation a little bit when we're talking about funding. If I've got two seconds left, I just wanted to say, I think this question of um, defining what ICH is in the monitoring and, in, and evaluation framework a lot of the data that we collect on ICH or living heritage related activity 
is not disaggregated from general cultural industries or general jobs. So, for example, midwives, traditional midwives might not be distinguished from sort of Western-trained midwives in any sort of um, statistics that the health sector collects. And so I think Ahmed's got an interesting suggestion there where we try and disaggregate some of the um, ICH-related jobs from other kinds of jobs uh, in the monitoring and evaluation. Thanks. Thank you. Now we move on to... Okay, I'll add to the challenges. So the idea of ICH jobs is excellent. But again, uh, from another point of view, I think we need to also cross-cut across the conventions. The reason, uh, the example I give, that we see poverty is decreasing, but there's no data which I can say that this investment is leading to this because cultural workers are not enumerated in India. And this might be true of many countries. So we are not distinguishing or we are not considering artists and cultural workers as workers. When we are doing worker, it is more of agriculture and um, industry and others. So there is a whole missing area. So I think we really need to look at the definition of creative industry, traditional knowledge sector, and see the cross-cutting impacts. And that is where I think a lot of research and policy making need to focus on in building cross-cutting definitions. I think that's where uh, we, if we just say ICH, then we lose, we lose you, someone spoke of the street dance. So, you know, we lose out on, you know, all the connections between contemporary culture and we always say traditional is contemporary because these artists are doing it today. It's not that they're doing it in the past. So I think we need to work at cross-cutting and connecting uh, conventions and policy making. And Voice of Civil Society is being integrated. UNESCO has been doing a lot of participatory survey in the last few years to get inputs. And I think Voice of Civil Society organization brings in the voice of communities. So that is really a very powerful tool. Thank you. Thank you. Our third panelist, uh, I'm not sure whether Ms. Chigua is still linked. Uh, when we try to hear from her, maybe we can move on to Your Excellency. Yes, <laughs> thank you so much. Bueno, um, in my language, I prefer now to make the conclusion in my language as if it's possible. I think that, first of all, muchísimas gracias por estar acá en esto, con estos thank you very much uh, este tan importante, for being también. here. Y mi actividad como miembro en el Poder and Ejecutivo, que tuve mucho tiempo en el Poder Ejecutivo, y ahora en esta, en esta enorme familia que es la UNESCO, y la posibilidad de ver cómo se implementan las políticas que se desarrollan en los países en la UNESCO y la relación. Cada vez uno tiene más claro que la única posibilidad que tenemos es que llegar clear, a la clear idea de las comunidades uh, the only possibility we have to become uh, more solidary, to uh, be more peaceful, is that in a, in a situation where we work with solidarity and culture, if we make children to value this work, for instance, in uh, regional and aboriginal communities, where sometimes they don't have the possibility to go to the big capitals, if we acknowledge this uh, work, because sometimes we know that it, it is in uh, communities when they show their cultural needs, they get paid not much, and the companies make money from that. So I believe that it is the responsibility from our governments and how the conventions from UNESCO are implemented in our governments, and we make them come to life. That is the main issue for me. Uh, we, I believe we have come forward during you know, the last years, and I believe that this convention is the convention of the future. And this is going to continue growing in the future. Uh, thank you very much for your, uh, your question. Uh, I think this is uh, uh, challenging. Um, 
it wasn't possible to, the, to, to elaborate the, the proposal, of course, but I think within this uh, uh, 2003 convention, uh, the reference are communities uh, that practice intangible culture, cultural heritage. Nothing can, can be done uh, when elaborating these typologies and uh, 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 prerequisites without the communities. And one of the challenges is that in many of these practices that are being integrated in modern uh, systems is uh, the, the, the fact that we are losing sometimes uh, social functions and cultural meaning. Uh, for example, in Morocco, we have craft centers uh, where young people are uh, as apprentices uh, work with masters to, uh, to master a, sort of, uh, a kind of craft. But the, what I pointed out when working with the uh, officials in Morocco is that uh, uh, in this process of integrating the crafts in, uh, and know-how in the modern system, we sometimes lose the rituals, the oral traditions, the songs that were practiced within traditional crafts. This is one of the challenges, but I think if we reflect on ways in which we can integrate this uh, 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 intangible cultural heritage in modern uh, systems, we should pay attention to this uh, to these aspects, to the social functions and to cultural meanings so that the elements continue to have meaning for the society. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Skunti. Um, actually, uh, we've exceeded the time given to our session uh, and uh, I think it's uh, time for us to conclude this session. I think in this session one, uh, we had a great start for the two-day meeting, and I think discussion and the presentation have been even more exciting and stimulating because all the presentations and discussions have been based on concrete examples, concrete cases, as any discussion on money-making or jobs should be. Uh, so uh, I would like to thank all the panelists here and online. And I also would like to thank your um, attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'd like to ask for your understanding that we had some technical issues due to um, the online connection. In session one, we had discussions on the topic of living heritage and sustainable livelihoods. And we also discussed how we can make stronger linkage between link living heritage and economic activities while minimizing potential negative impact of economic activity on ICH and how we can promote their contribution to sustainable livelihoods. Um, thank you. And buffet is prepared in the foyer, so please enjoy your lunch and enjoy your networking opportunities. The afternoon session will begin at 1 p.m. And from 1 p.m. till 2 p.m. on the second floor, there will be a separate session for uh, Category 2 Center staff members. So if you like to attend there, then please go to the second floor at 1 p.m. Thank you and bon appetit.